pray. All glory be to you, our Lord and our God, our Maker, our Redeemer. We ask for help this morning to benefit from your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 8 as we continue our way through this monumental chapter. Uh, I know I have been encouraged uh, by the study of Romans 8. I I know that uh, many of you have been encouraged. Uh, I'm confident that if we simply read Romans 8 on Sunday mornings together, uh, we would be encouraged. And so this morning, this is your pop quiz. You're supposed to have memorized Romans 8. So we're going to stand together, everybody on your mark, set, go. There is therefore now no condemnation. This is a, a staggering chapter that gives much comfort to the Christian. We've been talking about life in the Spirit. That is life in the Holy Spirit. Life united to Christ by the Holy Spirit of God indwelling the believer. This morning, we continue that theme, and we're going to get great comfort and assurance from the reality that the Holy Spirit of God indwells all who are born again. In John 16, 14, Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit, and and the Holy Spirit would come and glorify the Son. And the role of this person of the Trinity is to glorify the other members of the Trinity. And in that role, the Holy Spirit has not anywhere in Scripture sought to make a name for Himself. The spotlight is not on the Holy Spirit, His person, or His work. And yet, here in Romans 8, we get a condensed explanation of this critical work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And His presence And his relentless work in the heart of a believer is a ground of great assurance. In fact, what we'll look at in the next few verses helps to answer the question, am I a Christian? It's one thing to to gather objective truths from the Word of God. It's another thing altogether to have the subjective impression that those things are true of me. Eternal security for all who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, for all who have been born again and declared righteous by God, adopted into his family, those objective truths are true whether or not you feel positively about them. For every believer, eternal security is a Fort Knox reality that cannot be taken away. For all who have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ will be. From predestination to foreknowledge to calling to justification to glorification. And we'll get there later in Romans 8. But there is something else to the believer's assurance of salvation than merely belief in objective truths about things that are true of all Christians. Because the question remains, am I one of those? Am I a Christian? And this is a very real struggle for us. We live in a God-cursed world that is broken. We feel the effects of sin in us and all around us, and we wrestle with our own corruptions. And it's important to be able to answer this question. Do I have an interest in Christ? Am I on the trajectory to heaven? Have I been saved, and will I be finally rescued? And the personal presence and the relentless work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a a Christian grants assurance of these things. That's what we're going to examine this morning. And we're going to see this in a series of conditional statements, if-then statements. If this is true, then this. And these statements are geared, they are planned by God, by the Holy Spirit of God through the pen of the Apostle Paul to grant genuine believers assurance of salvation. And and all of these if-then statements come with the caveat, implied or in some cases explicitly stated, that these things are not true for non-Christians. And so 
while this passage serves primarily to assure genuine Christians that you are in Christ because of the active personal presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, they are also designed by God to help you examine whether or not you are a true Christian. Are you in the flesh or are you in the spirit? There's only two categories. Are you still under the realm of the tyranny of slavery to sin and the tyranny of death under law? Or have you been emancipated by the free grace of God in the gospel, set free experientially by the Holy Spirit of God? Is he in you and is his work manifest? Is it evident? And if it's not, this is a great opportunity for you who don't yet know Christ to see that more clearly. This passage serves as an assurance of salvation for believers and a test of salvation for those in doubt. Let's read together. Our text this morning is Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 14. God writes by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul these words. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Holy Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And what we have here are eight conditional statements to give assurance to genuine Christians by the personal presence and the relentless work of the Holy Spirit in his or her life. The first, sent, first statement is in the first half of verse 9, you are spiritual if the Holy Spirit is in you. You are spiritual if the Holy Spirit is in you. Here's what Paul says. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. This is a strong contrast to what has gone before. Last week, we looked at life in the flesh. This is a contrast. Notice the change in pronouns. He says you. You. Uh, that's different than the pronouns he's used before. The mind set on the flesh. Uh, whoever is in the flesh can't please God. But you, contrast, are in the Spirit. You're not in the flesh. And it makes this concept of life in the Spirit personal. Paul here applies this reality to his readers in a personal way. You Christians that I'm writing to are not in the flesh. Rather, you are in the Holy Spirit. There's been a transfer of dominions. And as we looked at a couple of weeks ago, there is with that transfer a new status, new governance, a new record, and a new way of life. And this is true if, if the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you. Notice how Paul says that, if he dwells in you, dwells is a verb taken from a, a noun that just means house or home, that is the Holy Spirit has taken up personal, intimate, relational, and experiential habitation in you. The Holy Spirit has made his home in you. He has taken up residence inside you permanently. And this is what it means to be spiritual. We hear that word spiritual all the time, oh, I'm a spiritual person. Well, listen, spiritual does not mean I'm in touch with the mysterious forces of the universe, or I'm in touch with my chi, or I've applied the principles of feng shui to arrange the energy of forces in my life, or maybe I spent a week in Sedona. It doesn't mean I've simplified my life, or I've practiced brain-emptying meditation, or I've read some religious literature. It doesn't mean being open-minded or kind to animals or ecologically aware. It certainly does not mean talking to spirits or hunting for aliens or communicating with the dead. There is only one way to be spiritual in any real sense of that word. That is, the Holy Spirit of God must take up residence 
in you. He must make a home in your heart. And the reality of his presence is a great assurance and comfort for true Christians. Because the Spirit of God is in them, and His presence in their lives produces a transformation that can be seen and felt and experienced. This is a cause of genuine rejoicing for God's people, even in the midst of difficult trials, external difficulties, or struggle with sin, internal corruptions. The Spirit of God is inside you, and He is doing what could not come natural to you. There's a second conditional statement, second half of verse 9. I would summarize it this way. You're not a Christian if the Holy Spirit is not in you. You're not a Christian if the Holy Spirit is not in you. Paul says it this way. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. That is, he does not belong to Christ. It's a very simple statement. Notice the the Spirit of God here in in verse 9 is interchangeable with the Spirit of Christ in the second half of verse 9. Notice also the change in pronouns to anyone, to anyone. He said, you, in the first half of verse 9, now he changes it to anyone. This no longer is the personal warm address to to his readers, but the necessary caveat Anybody else who's reading this who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ needs to understand if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you do not belong to Christ. There's no such thing as a Holy Spirit-less Christian. And so there is no assurance that God is pleased with you and you do not have eternal life. Listen, someone with no appetite for spiritual things is not a Christian, no matter what he professes. If you do not have an internal drive to please God, if you don't have a desire to fight your own sin, if you don't love God's people, if you have no evidence of the Spirit of God doing supernatural work on the inside, then you are not a Christian. Not in God's book anyway. Billions of people on the earth call themselves Christians, and that is a title either by heredity or culture or some sort of affiliation, but only those indwelt by the Holy Spirit are true Christians. One has said it this way, the indwelling Holy Spirit is the sine qua non of Christian experience. In other words, you can't be a Christian without it. Only the indwelling of Christ's Spirit proves a real relationship to Him. There's a third conditional statement for us to look at this morning. Again, designed to give the true Christian assurance of salvation. It's verse 10. I'd summarize it this way. Life is in you if the Holy Spirit is in you. And Paul says this. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is life because of righteousness. The point of verse 10 is this. The Holy Spirit in you is life, even though your physical body is subject to death. There's several points to understand here. If Christ is in you, he says, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit in you. Now he says, if Christ is in you, there is a close relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit. They're not the same. They're separate persons. And yet their union and their uniformity of purpose means that Paul can speak freely of Christ being in you. Christ is in you. He is called the hope of glory in the believer. And the Spirit of Christ permanently lives and operates in us. Being in Christ and Christ being in us means that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He lives and he works. And Paul makes this concession though the body is dead because of sin. And it's necessary for him to make this concession. We, we talk about the Holy Spirit being life, and, and if anyone has believed in Christ, he now possesses eternal life, an eternal life that begins at new birth and never ends. And yet, we still die physically. And we feel around us the, the, the sting of death. We feel in us the physical decline and the inevitable reality that unless Jesus comes and takes us home and changes us in the twinkling of an eye, we too will face our own mortality. 
our friends are experiencing the decaying of the outer man, though their inner man is being renewed day by day. This inevitable common experience of physical death is, is real. Your physical frame is dying. And Paul says it's dying because of sin. Because of the fall of man and because of sin in the world. There, it's not a, a link between some individual sin you committed and your physical demise as a result. That can happen. But just generally speaking, we die because we're sinners. It's part of what it means to, to live here as a sinner on the earth. Your body is the vehicle that sin employs, and it is the vessel that feels the costly effects of sin. Death is due to sin. And a Christian who has been removed from the tyranny of sin and death, who has been given eternal life at new birth, might wonder at times, is this eternal life thing real? I feel death. Have I really been made alive? And every day as you grow older, you feel the physical decline. Every doctor's visit is one more reminder that this physicality is coming to an end. Death all around, the loss of loved ones. All of this is a potential discouragement to the Christian. And the reminder here is, though the body is dead because of sin, know this Christian Life is in you. And life is in you because the Holy Spirit is in you. In verse 10, Paul is referring to the Holy Spirit, not the human spirit. It should be capitalized in your English translation. And the Holy Spirit is life, he says. Uh, the New American Standard says the Spirit is alive, making it, the word an adjective. Uh, Paul uses this word 37 times. It's only ever always used as a noun. It should be translated life. The Holy Spirit is life. And in this very context, in Romans 8.2, Paul said the Spirit is life. And in 8.6, he said that we are to have the mindset of the Spirit. And to have the mindset of the Spirit is to have the mindset of life. It's right here in this verse to characterize the Spirit as life. He is the source of life, the sustainer of life. He is the one that gives and produces and energizes spiritual life in the believer. Jesus made it clear in John 3 to Nicodemus, it is only because of the work of the Spirit that any man is ever born again. And this Spirit who is life is in you, Christian. So Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, though the outer man is decaying, the inner man is being renewed day by day by the Spirit. And notice the Spirit is life on account of righteousness. This is not righteousness imparted, the things that you do that Paul is referring to here. This is righteousness imputed, the free gift of God's righteousness to your account through the gospel by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Because you are declared righteous by God, you are in this category now of life. And the spirit who is life is in you. And this contrast is so critical to our encouragement. To live in a physical body subject to death while eternal life is in us, there's a tension there. And, and this tension is God's good design. Have you ever wondered about that? God, if you've saved me, if, if you've new birthed me, if I have eternal life in me, why do we have to go through this thing called death? This is God's design for now. And we need to remember that physical death humbles us, keeps us humble, dependent on the Lord. Physical death also causes us to feel the gravity of sin, a reminder of who we were and what we deserve. Oh, I've been swimming in poison my whole life and it has been killing me. I've been breathing in poison all my life, and it has been killing me. The, the, the result of sin is death. It's like growing up around radiation, you know, to, to be born in the Ukraine after nuclear disaster will eventually have its effects. Death helps us see the beauty of of grace, forgiving grace, transforming grace. 
The reality of physical death helps us anticipate the glory of eternal life in God's presence. It helps us to look forward to perfect likeness to Christ. It helps us to look forward to what God will do with death. Paul calls death that last enemy. And in 1 Corinthians 15, death is the instrument God uses to turn weakness into power. To take the heavenly and transform it into, take the earthy and transform it into the heavenly. To take that which is sown in weakness and turn it into strength, that which is natural and make it supernatural or spiritual. You recognize that the resurrection body that we get, Paul calls in 1 Corinthians 15, a spiritual body. That doesn't mean it's not tangible. It doesn't mean it doesn't actually exist, some sort of vapor. No, it's a real physicality, but it is called a spiritual physicality. Your resurrection body is supernatural, transcends what you have now. And God uses physical death to accomplish something totally contrary to death's nature. (laughs) Death separates, death destroys, death decomposes. God makes the enemy surrender to the Christian's purpose. Death bows the knee and is the transformative process for resurrection. What power that God has to make even that last enemy serve our glorious purposes. And of course, death itself will be thrown into the lake of fire. Death will die. The Holy Spirit is said to be the seal of our redemption. He is the down payment on the guarantee of eternity. But listen, if we've thought of this seal as some sort of a stamp, an embossed, raised marking on the document of your salvation, we need to rethink that. The seal of our salvation is a person living inside you, at work in you. And his presence in your life, Christian, is the down payment of the security of your final redemption and your resurrection. You see, the life produced by the Holy Spirit is stronger than death. He transcends death. He outlasts death. And this leads us to the next conditional statement we must see to have the assurance that the Holy Spirit provides. The assurance of our unbreakable relationship to God. It's going to lead us to the end of Romans 8. Not even death can separate you from the love of God. Because verse 11, resurrection is guaranteed if the Holy Spirit is in you. Resurrection is guaranteed if the Holy Spirit is in you. Here's what Paul says. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The spirit who is life will even give life to our mortal bodies. Our physicality subject to death will be given life by the Spirit who is life and who dwells in us. The Holy Spirit here in verse 11 is said to be the agent of our resurrection. Notice, the Spirit of Him, the Him is the Father. The Spirit of Him, God the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead. If that Spirit dwells in you, then God the Father, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Here, the promise of bodily resurrection, a new eternal physicality, a physicality that will be given new properties, new qualities, buried, natural, raised, spiritual. The Holy Spirit of God who dwells in you cannot be overcome by your physical mortality. This is tremendous comfort for every believer and especially on the threshold of eternity. These are the things I want to think about in in my last hours. Maybe hours of mental confusion and, and physical weakness, darkness, mystery, like taking a leap off into the unknown. What do I want to cling to? I want to cling to these things. That the Holy Spirit has produced real spiritual life Here, now, while in this body, 
Even while this body is subject to death, he's been in me and he is life. And you can trust him to do what he has set out to do. Like a friend who has held your hand faithfully through difficult steps before, he will be with you faithfully in these last steps through that threshold between life here and life in glory. To take your hand, take a breath, jump over the side. Like a parent who holds the hands of a toddler taking some first wobbly steps. And when that parent leads the child to take bigger steps, bolder steps, steps the child has never taken before, the the child can trust mom. Because these steps are familiar territory for her. She has taken these steps. She has walked other children through these steps. She's taking this toddler through these steps. And when you, Christian, take your last steps on this earth and prepare for one more step that might feel like a leap into the unknown, know this. This is a well-worn path for the Holy Spirit of God. He has faithfully taken God's precious saints across this threshold again and again. You are known and you are loved. And he will never let you go. Paul introduced us to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit here in Romans 5, 5. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. That gets expanded here in chapter 8. It culminates in that great no separation clause at the end of the chapter. Not even death can separate you from the love of God. Why? Because the Spirit's present work in your life is an assurance of victory over death. Here is the comfort and assurance for your heart in your declining hours. The Holy Spirit has produced life in you. You've seen it. You've felt it. You've experienced it. And he holds your hand through the threshold of darkness into the bright light of eternal glory and life that never ends. Life undimmed by sin and turmoil and sadness and the curse, culminating in physical resurrection and the eternal state. There's a fifth conditional statement here in this passage designed to give assurance of salvation to true Christians. New loyalty. You experience a new loyalty if the Spirit of Christ is in you. Paul says, so then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And there's kind of a dot, dot, dot in this verse. We're under obligation, not to this, but to something else is left unsaid, but it's implied. This new obligation is a statement of fact, (laughs) You are under new management. You are now bound in loyalty to this new management, Christian. It's just true of you. This is the first implication that Paul draws from the truth of our being in the Spirit. Therefore, then, he says, we are obligated. We're obligated. Not to the flesh. We're loyal to this new governance. And notice the pronoun change again. So then, brethren, we. Again, this one's personal and inclusive. We Christians are obligated to the Spirit's work. We're not obligated to the flesh. Again, flesh in this context is unredeemed human fallenness. Unredeemed human fallenness. Uh, One commentator has said it this way. All that is characteristic of this life in its rebellion against God. That's what Paul means by flesh in this context. And for a non-Christian, that's all he is, flesh, through and through, 100%, no mixed condition, in the realm of flesh, totally flesh, all unredeemed. But for the believer, flesh is a residual reality. There is the residue of our depravity still in the life of a believer, This is what we call the mixed condition. Whatever is left in us that is characteristic of this life and its rebellion against God. It is the influence of the flesh in us that has not been removed. Even though we've been removed from the dominion of the flesh, 
the reality of residual depravity has not yet been removed from us. The Holy Spirit in you means that the Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence, management, governance in a person who is declared righteous by God and who still finds in himself the vestiges of rebellion against God. Remember, flesh here does not refer to your body or something merely external. It is all that remains of unredeemed fallenness in you. And this remaining rebellion in the life of a Christian is bound up in the thoughts, the motives, the emotions, the will. These internal realities working themselves outward in manifest sins of various kinds. And you know this to be true experientially. In fact, as a Christian, with the Holy Spirit residing in you, you're grieved over your internal corruptions in ways you never could be when you were in the flesh, when you were totally flesh, all flesh. You're not a slave of sin, Christian, but you find yourselves at times presenting your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, as Paul puts it in 6.13. And what Paul says in Romans 6 is very similar to what he's getting at here in Romans 8. You're not a slave, therefore do not let sin reign. And here in verse 8, the Spirit is in you, therefore you're obligated in a new loyalty to the work of the Spirit. And he says this because the realities of residual flesh are very real and they are very strong. Here in Romans 8, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, you are under obligation to Him. In fact, what a contradiction it would be to be emancipated by the Holy Spirit only to yield obedience to the tyranny of sin in the flesh, the very slavery from which we were set free. To be in the Spirit is to have a new loyalty. And this new loyalty you find in yourself is actually a ground of assurance, believer. In the Spirit, you obey because you can There's a sixth conditional statement, and this one is negative. It's in the first half of verse 13. I'd summarize it this way. Hell is your destiny if the Spirit is not in you. Hell is your destiny if the Spirit is not in you. Paul says, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die, or you are about to die. Life lived under the standard of the flesh that is, a merely natural existence in unbroken rebellion against God, it can only lead to one place. It can only lead to death. And by death here, Paul means ultimate death, eternal death. Physical death followed by an appearance before God for judgment and sentencing, followed by the lake of fire, eternal hell. You paying for your own sins under the wrath of God forever. To live according to the flesh means to be without the Holy Spirit altogether. It is a continual, uninterrupted life of what comes only natural to humans since the fall of mankind. Notice the pronoun here in the verse, you. This is still personal, and it serves as a warning to those who have not yet experienced new birth by the Holy Spirit. If you keep living the way you are without the Spirit, the only result will be eternal destruction. There are only two ways of living, only two trajectories in life, only two destinies, only two eternal destinations. You can't take the road to Yuma and end up in Flagstaff. You cannot live a life according to the flesh and hope to end up in heaven. A life characterized by the flesh can only lead to eternal death. However, the second half of verse 13 gives us our sixth Conditional statement, heaven is your destiny if the Spirit is in you. Heaven is your destiny if the Spirit is in you. And again, this is a statement of fact. But if, by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If the Holy Spirit is in you, here's just what's true of you, Christian. You will live a life characterized by the putting to death the deeds of the body. And if that is so, if that's you, you will live forever. To live here is is to live forever, to have eternal life, to have heaven as your destination. So how do I know now that I'm destined for heaven? If there is a continual pattern of the mortification of sin. 
Does that exist in your life? If you're a Christian, it does. To one degree or another, there is the pattern of putting to death deeds of the body in your life. It's inevitable. It's what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. And if that pattern does not exist, if that is not tangible in any way, then you must ask fundamental questions. Is the Holy Spirit in me? Because if he's in you, what does he do? He causes us to put to death the deeds of the body. It's what it means to be a Christian. This is tangible evidence of the Holy Spirit's taking up residence in you. And this is the experiential reality that Paul hinted at back in chapter 7. Look at Romans 7, 5. For while we were in the flesh, again, in the domain of the flesh, the realm of the flesh, under the tyranny of sin, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now, verse 6, we have been released from the law having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. You see, the Spirit is life, the Spirit produces life, and part of that life is the putting to death the deeds of the body. It's what you couldn't do when you were in the flesh. It's what inevitably happens in your life when you are in the Spirit. You all by yourself were only flesh, and when you were born again, you believed the gospel, turned from sin to God, and the new you began. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And what is this new creation characterized by? Well, the gospel of God liberated you from the penalty of sin, and the Holy Spirit of God liberated you from slavery to sin. He took up residence in you. He produces a new mindset. He grants you new abilities. He fosters new motives, new desires, new activities. And when he finds himself in this environment called you, he begins to clean house. There remains in you the residue of your merely natural state. And now a process has begun in which God's Holy Spirit does battle with those residual rebellions. Evil thoughts, foul motives, wicked desires, a stubborn will. All these things in you which displease God, they find an opponent. An opponent, an opponent ready to do battle. This supernatural, holy person taking up residence in the believer produces new thoughts, new motives, new desires, and a yielded will. And a battle is on in the life of a Christian. A battle that can only end in glorious victory. What does this battle look like? (laughs) What is the evidence that the Holy Spirit actually lives in you, Christian? It is you putting to death the deeds of the body. You. The old unbroken pattern was sin was killing you. The new pattern is you killing sin. Romans 8.13 makes it clear that the sin nature is not totally eradicated in the believer. In fact, remaining sin in us is strong, so strong that it requires drastic measures. Not, hey, just wait and see what will happen to you. Not, oh, give the sin in your heart and life a thought every once in a while. But an ongoing, progressive, continual pattern of killing sin. A serious battle involving serious activity. And who is it in Romans 8.13 that mortifies or kills sin? It's you. And by what power? How? By the Holy Spirit. Your thoughts, your efforts, your energies, your attention, your will. How? By the Holy Spirit. It is His work in you to will and to do. You labor and you strive by His powerful working within you. And listen, Christian, if you find in you a lifestyle of desiring to please the Lord, of searching out and destroying the things in you that are displeasing to the Lord, you can only give credit to the Holy Spirit. You couldn't muster that up yourself. That is what he produces. 
An older saint said this, no man overcomes the corruptions of his heart but by the influence of the Spirit of God. This is impossible work that you do by the Spirit. And notice what Paul is arguing here in verse 13. He's not saying mortification merits life. If you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you earn heaven. He's not saying that. He's not saying if you're killing sin, you earn a spot. He is saying only mortifiers live forever. And he also is saying all mortifiers live forever. The ones who are putting to death the deeds of the body by the indwelling Spirit of God are the same people who show up in heaven. This is what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. It's not the ground of salvation. It is simply the reality for those who are saved. And it is the tangible evidence that you are a real Christian. Real Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can do no other than take up a fight against those things in you that displease God. So a life that is characterized by the regular putting to death the deeds of the body is a life that has been declared righteous by God and will unfailingly be with God in heaven. You see, the Holy Spirit's life makes it both necessary and possible for you to obey God, to fight sin. By simple faith, a life yielded to Him in obedience. What does the Spirit's work look like in a Christian? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. These are the things that you do that the Holy Spirit produces in you. You do them, and the Holy Spirit produces them in you. Do you see this in your life? Do you find evidence in your life of a desire to put sin to death when you find it? If you do, this is positive ground for assurance of salvation. Listen, the ground of your assurance is not, I'm done with sin. I haven't sinned in three weeks, I'm assured. No, <laughs> the ground of assurance is there's a fight on in me. And I desire to be pleasing to the Lord. And I'm seeing the Holy Spirit at work in me to put to death the deeds of the body. It's the work of God in your life. It leads to a last conditional statement given to produce assurance of the love of God and an assurance of salvation, you are a child of God if the Holy Spirit is in you. You are a child of God if the Holy Spirit is in you. Look what Paul says in verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. I want you to notice the connection of verse 14 to verses 12 and 13. Back up to verse 12. Therefore then, brethren, it's a significant shift in the argument. We are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, you're living according to the, if you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. This is a cascade of explanations. And you can't separate verse 14 from verse 13. What is the leading of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, 14? It is the Holy Spirit leading believers to put to death the deeds of the body. This is what Paul is talking about here. It's, it's an evidence of new life in you and a great ground of assurance that you belong to Him. The Holy Spirit is in you and He's leading you. Leading you to do what? To kill sin. To fight your own internal corruptions. The, the leading of the Holy Spirit here is not about guidance, but governance. Paul is not talking here about how to make decisions. Should I take this job? You know, I need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not here talking about mystical revelation. Can I have some new insights into truth? Can I just hear from God? It's not about being told what is right or, or what to do next. It is the reliable governance of the Holy Spirit to cause you to put to death the deeds of the body. These two things are connected. The whole direction of a Christian's life is to be controlled by, governed by, determined by the work of the Spirit of God in us. The Spirit is the agent in our sanctification. One commentator said that it is His work that accounts for our obedience. That's right. 
Without the Spirit of God, we could never obey Him in a way that was pleasing. Listen, to, to, to say things, and I don't know if we say these out loud, but, but I've harbored these thoughts. I don't know if you can relate to this. You know, I don't need to read my Bible today. I, I just need to be led by the Spirit. Or I don't need to, to study my Bible. I, I, just, I just need to be led by the Spirit. Those kinds of thoughts, if, whether said them out loud or, or if they're just internal, subtly stated, believed, those thoughts actually run contrary to the way the Spirit leads. Maybe you've tried to help somebody see a blind spot in their life, and they respond with something like, you know, I don't need all this attention on fighting my sin. That's legalism. I just need the Spirit. Well, well wait a second. What does the Spirit do? What is the actual tangible evidence of the Spirit's work in the life of a believer? to lead us to put to death the deeds of the body. This is the Spirit's work. The Bible is the Spirit's word. It's the word that He penned. It's the word that He gave us. We can actually claim to be connected with God's Spirit while frustrating His work in our lives. In fact, the Holy Spirit's leadership in your life would would lead us to kill those thoughts, to put to death the idea that I could survive the Christian life without putting myself under the Word of God. That's not a God-pleasing thought. That's the kind of thought that the Holy Spirit would lead us to put to death. Take up your Bible. What does Ephesians 6 call the Bible? The sword of the whom? The Spirit. Spirit's not an it, he's a he, he's a person. The word of God is his sword. He wrote it. He intended it to guide our lives. He, the Holy Spirit of God, uses the word of God in the life of the people of God to accomplish the purposes of God for the glory of God. This is the way he works. The spirit is not opposed to the word any more than the Holy Spirit is opposed to the Father or to the Son. To be governed by the way the Holy Spirit thinks is to put our minds under it, to yield to it, to be governed by the way He thinks, to to do the things that He's interested in. And I'm afraid that we give our own corrupt thoughts far too much credit. We're too quick to remove ourselves from the leadership of the Spirit and to replace His real leadership with our own ideas. By the way, there are only two places in Scripture that talk about how the Holy Spirit leads the believer. And did you know that both of them tell us that the leading of the Holy Spirit is about putting to death our own sin? And maybe this afternoon a good homework assignment is to read Galatians 5, 6 6 to 23, or 16 to 23. Galatians 5 and Romans 8 are the two passages in your New Testament that talk about the leading of the Holy Spirit. And, And both of them have to do with the Spirit's leading in crucifying sin in us. So how are we to be led by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body? You know, Paul here does not lay out the details for us in how to do that. But it's not particularly complicated. Is the answer, I need to read my Bible more and pray more? Yes, (laughs) that's the answer. And as we do that, as we put our lives under the word of God in yielded faith, and we surrender ourselves to him, God, I want to do whatever you do, and I trust you and I trust your ways. And as we yield ourselves in dependence on God for his supernatural work in us, and we express that dependence in prayer, God, please do work in me. You said the fruit of your spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Can I see more of that in my life? Will you please make me more like your son? It's what you have purposed. Please do that. And I'm going to put myself under your word to think your thoughts after you. Would you use your word in my life to make me more like your son? And listen, we're confident that God leads his children providentially, purposefully, carefully. He's sovereign over the universe and sovereign over every detail down to the meticulous details of life. And as we put one foot in front of the other, God is faithful to lead us in terms of direction and decision-making and those kinds of things. 
But to be led by the Holy Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body means to put myself under the word of God, to be dependent in prayer, to recognize sin, to see it where it is in me, to to fix my heart on pleasing God, to go to his word, to pray for help, to seek to submit my emotions, my motives, my thoughts, my actions to him, to trust him, to yield, to go his way. And the point of Romans 14 is this. Uh, Romans 8, 14 is this. If you see this work of the Holy Spirit in your life, Christian, take comfort. His work's not done in you, but his work has begun, and it's feelable, tangible, real. He's done these things in my life. I can look back and see it. He's doing these things in my life now. God has intended the personal presence and relentless work of the Holy Spirit to be in you so that you can have assurance that you belong to him. He's the seal of our redemption. He's walked with you since the day you were born again. He will walk with you every day of your Christian life, and he will walk with you through your mortality into eternal life until you have arrived in God's glorious presence. And this leads us to an amazing reality in the second half of verse 14. Everyone who is being led by the Spirit of God to put to, deed, to, de- put to death the deeds of the body. Who are these people? The children of God. Which introduces us to the grand and glorious doctrine of adoption. Which we'll begin exploring next week. Let's pray. God, thank you for your truth. We can't thank you enough for your Holy Spirit who has not desired the limelight, the spotlight, who has always sought to bring glory to the other Trinitarian members of the Godhead, who delights to bring glory to the Son by taking those whom the Son has purchased with his blood and cleaning us up, conforming us to his image that we might be presented spotless, blameless before you so that our practice would one day conform to the declaration over us. And God, this is all of your grace, all of your kindness. We thank you for the assurance that the Holy Spirit provides in life, through life's trials, in the midst of wrestling with internal corruptions, and then on our darkest hour, facing the threshold of eternity to arrive in your glorious presence. With him, the Holy Spirit, assuring all the way that we can never be separated from your love. For that we thank you and depend in Jesus' name.